What's up, folks? After five weeks of labor, 12 hours of really hard work, I'm pleased to announce the Quality of Life Dashboard version 4. The code is out on GitHub. If you're looking for version 3, that will be in the version 3 branch. And have at it. Let me show you all the different things this can do. There are two nav bars. There's one on the left and one on the right. One on the left has links and your site title. It's all configurable in the uh, configuration file. Social media links, contact form. And there's instructions on how to make one of those on the server side if, if you need to. And help which will be a YouTube video, which I haven't done yet. So right now you get Rick Astley, which is arguably just as good as seeing me on YouTube. In your configuration file, if you don't set a contact or help, it just leaves those buttons off. The other nav bar on the right is for your metrics. And your metrics are going to come out sorted by the name of the metric. And you can filter those by tag and just see the particular ones in those tags. Now before each metric in the configuration would have a category, a single string, now it has an array of strings that are the tags for each one. So you don't have that situation where a metric could really be involved in three different categories, but you can only pick one. Now you just tag metrics with whatever they belong into and they will just filter that way. That is how you can add metrics. So pick that one, it'll add it to our map. You can also remove the metrics here. And your there's a what's new array you can set in the configuration to highlight metrics that you've recently added or updated. And then you'll get these, this little new thing next to them to highlight those. Now, the big difference between this and the old versions of the dashboard is this is now multi-metric. Old dashboards were always a single metric at a time. Now you can view as many as you want. You can rearrange them via drag and drop. On the main screen, there is the metric in the first position is the big one. It's the big card. And the big card lets you do and see more things. This is a CSS grid layout. So you, if you drag something over here, that becomes the big card like that. On the big par card, the map is interactive. You can pan and zoom and do all of your crazy pan and zoom like things. There's a full extent button. You can make it really big if, if you want it. You know, you're like, I need to see my entire monitor filled up. You can track your location and that will show your location and select that NPA that you are at. Now, if you're driving in a car and you do this and you drive through more than one polygon, it'll just highlight all the polygons you drive through and just, just select all of those, which is something that will never happen. I still think is really cool. And now the clear selected button is up on the map. It used to be it's another thing somewhere else, which was not very smart, but you know, that's how I rolled back then. The legend is in the top left of the map. It is uh, built on the fly. And these circles are SVG circles, so they will print. It's not like a background color that, that you have to click special things to get to print. Those, these will print out fine. It's built on the fly, and it's built, the number of breaks is based on your color scheme. And you can have more than one color scheme now. It used to be we just had X many breaks and this is your colors. Now you can you have a default color scheme, which in my case are these colors and there's five different ones. And it will make the breaks five breaks and use those colors. You can have different color schemes and specify in your metric to use this other color scheme. And it will use those colors and the number of breaks that are the number of colors in that color breaks. So this one over here has seven breaks and these are the colors it use. Now you can have a custom number of breaks and custom colors for different metrics. And if you hover over these, you'll see them highlighted on the map and then you can click it if you want to select that particular quantile for whatever reason. 
So down below the map, uh, you'll see a slider where you can control the year if you have more than one year. If you only have a single year, that year number will appear in the exact same location. It just won't show a slider for that. If you have a subtitle configured for your metric, that'll show up here. Then you have your, your numbers and that's your main number for what you have selected. Then you have this compare to section. And it used to be you would only compare to what your whole data set was, whether that was a city or a county, whatever you called that. Now you can specify additional things to compare to in two different ways. You can specify for a particular geography, some, you could say, give me Charlotte, and then I will tell it this is the list of neighborhood IDs to include with Charlotte. And now it'll include that for any metric using that geography, it'll, it'll include what we define as Charlotte in there. We'll also include Charlotte in the trend chart because it's a, a calculated, uh, calculated value. You can also, I think I have one for there. Yeah, you can also, for an individual metric, just give it a static thing to list in the comparisons. Like for population density, I put in Philadelphia 2018 and a value of five, and it will just always tack that on the end of the things to compare to numbers. Spoiler. I made up five. I really don't know what it is for Philadelphia, but that's something you can do per metric and well. And that gives you more points of reference to say what this number looks like. Because remember, we're a judgment-free zone. Uh, figuring out whether this number means your neighborhood's great or terrible, we don't get into that business. But this will give you a lot of points of reference to figure out how it's doing relative to other things. And then you have your trend chart and you can see it's got this hover effect so you can see the exact values for each one and it's a little hard to see well, let's see a little bit better it looks like uh, charlotte and mecklenburg are following pretty tightly in some of these as one might expect but there's actually three different lines you can, there, there's the data table, it's still here. It's hidden by default. I tried to make it so no card had horizontal scrolling by default. But if your card, uh, or vertical scrolling, it should never have horizontal scrolling. It uh, will only have horizontal scrolling if you toggle this, toggle this table on. Now, if you hover over here on the table, you can see it highlighted on the map. Uh, you really can't see the map, whole map and the table on at the same time. But this is really important to some people I work with for some reason. So it's, it, it does that. Uh, you can sort on anything in the table. It also does paging. So you don't get that situation where I have 100 things selected and now this table's, you know, uh, half a mile long. You can specify the number of rows to see at a time. And you can still see all of them if you want. And you can page through them. So that's neat, that's the data table. Down at the bottom on the big card, you have a search and you can select by geography. Now search is all configured in the configuration files now. You don't need to monkey around with the search component. By default, for a geography, it will search on the neighborhood ID. So we could find our particular NPA here that way. You can set up, uh, also set up a search that will work in any kind of geography. And that's a kind of search that will return a lat long coordinate like an address. You can pick one of those. You can also uh, look for like a zip. For each geography type, you can set up a search that will return a list of neighborhood IDs like if we pick a zip code, it will run off and select everything in that zip code. So you can set up search searches, additional searches beyond just your geography ID for everything, and those will return an XY. Or you can search set up searches that will hit an API that will return a list of IDs. So if you want all the uh, polygons that intersect. Uh, zip code or a political boundary or anything like that. 
You can also have uh, select by geography groups. These are also set up. These are actually in your configuration, you will set up a URL and that can be to a static JSON file or to an API. And that is again, just a list of neighborhood IDs. So we can go select all those neighborhood IDs. If you don't specify any uh, subsets of geographies to select, then this, this just won't appear. Each metric also has this drop down menu. You can download the metric as a CSV, only the selected as a CSV. Download as GeoJSON, only the selected is GeoJSON. It'll ask you where to put it. It'll name it whatever the metric name is. You can view your metadata. And previously, the metadata was very strictly form formatted because I was doing uh, some ill-advised text processing on it. So if you put in an additional H3 tag, your whole world would end. Now the metadata, the markdown, is just dumped straight into this div. So you can have the metadata be anything you want. And you can also download the metadata as well. It'll download it as an HTML file. Uh, for instance, over here on this thing I just made up, well, it's real data, but I, I didn't do a lot of work to insert it. I put in a very important link to a very important chart uh, about this particular thing. Uh, yeah. So the metadata now is free form, just go nuts, whatever makes the most sense for that particular metric. You can also close, uh, besides just, you can uh, close things here. You can also close them on each individual card. These small cards have a, a static map. You can't pan or zoom. These are meant to be multiple, like small multiple sort of maps. And you have to toggle back and forth between the different things you want to see. And the data table, since it a lot of times won't fit, will scroll as such. So those are the different cards. Another option on the menu is to uh, embed a particular card and you can do a small size or a large size and this is just change the style for the iframe tag and those look like this so you basically get that exact same card in either the the big card size or the small card size um, depending on how big you make your iframe uh, a few things are missing like I don't want you to be able to change the selected set because I assume you're embedding with a selected set to show something in particular. Uh, but for the most part, these are identical cards sharing the same code. And there's one more thing to show you. Uh, print. Print used to go to this super uh, uh, not great uh, form. Uh, or, or a whole separate project really. And it would print out where you get one big map that's just of one metric. And then everything else is this giant spreadsheet kind of thing with only the latest year. And it's fair to say it was not great. Now the printing is built in and it just restyles the page. It gives you some instructions here. You have a report sort of in Make it any title, any title you want here. And each individual map, you can structure and orient however you want. You can change, say, in, in this map, I want to view this. And, and I want to see, you know, a little bit of the data table. And this map, I'll leave it like that. This map, I want to get all nuts. You can do it any way you want. And then just hit print. And it's going to uh, uh, make a very nice form. Let's see if I can find a. I printed out a. Ah, yeah, I printed out a test print here somewhere. Let's see. We've got this nice form printed out, where each metric will take a single page. And you can kind of tell your story that way. The uh, each metric will take a page, 
Now a metric may take more than one if you have a bunch selected and you decide to show them all in a table. That's going to stretch more than one page. Overall, each metric uh, by default will take up a single page formatted all pretty. And it's all built right into the dashboard. You hit close and it'll go back to your regular viewing pleasure. So that is how all that stuff works. I've poked around on it on Edge and Chrome and Firefox and uh, i11 and Safari on iOS and Chrome on Android and it all seems to work. On i11 I had to, because the CSS grid support there is not good, it does a fallback flexbox layout which isn't quite as nice because instead of being able to wrap two rows of small ones here, it can only do one row and then the next one has to go down below because that's just how Flexbox works. But I-11 people are used to living terrible shallow lives and I, I, you know, I, I can't be bothered. Uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit of how the code configuration works because, oh, one thing that's going to be very big for some folks for the dashboard was one geography and that was it so you had NPAs in our case and a lot of people have things in more than one geography and for very good reasons and to shoehorn that in was just rough stuff now that's just part of the configuration so these over here are NPAs this is census block groups this is a totally different geography and it works just fine. The only difference is because they don't share geography, when I select something here, it does not select it over here and vice versa because they're different polygons. So you will have to select things uh, approximating the same area and the different geographies if you want to compare apples to apples like that. But you can have more than one geography just by setting it up in the configuration. Let me show you some of that stuff. And I won't go into too much detail because it's all relatively okay documented on the website, I hope. Let's see, make this bigger. So your configuration is now in a data.js and an options.js. In your options, what you do for different geographies is you'll set up your geo you'll set up a default geojson and this is the geojson your geography you'll use if if no other geography is specified by the metric and then you'll have a geojson array of objects and each one will set up configuration options for that geojson and here's the one I was using for I call it tracks even though it's block groups cuz I'm a moron uh I give it a name and a description and this compare groups is what I want to appear that little box of things to compare it to and if you don't specify any IDs for this compare group it'll just use the whole data set and call it in this case Mecklenburg now this mpa.geojson our, our other geography group I give an additional comparison group and this is just pointing at a JSON file. And the JSON file is just an array of IDs. You can also point it to an API. And every thing like this includes a format function. And then if you include a format function, it is going to run the results of that URL call through that format function. And what that lets you do is if you have an API that returns data that's not just an array of IDs, you can transform it into that. Uh, right here. Now select groups are the same sort of thing. You can include a format function for these if you're hitting an API. Here I'm just hitting flat files of hand curated lists, believe it or not. Search paths are the same way. Well, it includes a search val, which is how you want to process what the search string is. And then you can also format it. Here I'm hitting one of our APIs and then I'm translating that API into a list of IDs. And that's how you'd use that format function. So that's how you can, it's, it's as easy as setting up more than one GeoJSON type in your uh, options. Then on the data end of things, 
for each metric, see we have tags now instead of uh, dang up one of my tags is Pac-Man. I mean, just just let me let me be me. But here you can specify uh, the GeoJSON layer if it isn't the default, and this tells it to use that tracks.geojson, even though it's block groups because. I, I just, I, yeah, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I'm a busy person. Notice I've also specified colors here, and that colors is orange. Back in our options, scroll down away, we can see our colors is an object, uh, and it has a default, which will be our default colors. And these are other things I can just put that colors and use that name, and the number of colors is the number of breaks and the color itself is the color that is going to be used. So that's how all of that works. Uh, the grid, interesting way to do uh, a fallback flex box for IE11. It's like this grid container, I give it the flex box kind of stuff. And then I use this at supports, which IE11 will ignore say if it supports grid, I just kind of overwrite all that stuff. And it's the same thing with each individual uh, grid item in that first grid child that's extra big. So that's a quick and dirty way to, to fall back to Flexbox for CSS grid stuff. For IE11, which sucks and we, no one should use it, but they, they do. So what can you do? That is the new dashboard, and you can see it at the dev site, which is mcmap.org slash qol-dev. Uh, it's pretty well ready to go, but I haven't showed it to uh, the nerd herd yet. And the way the dashboard project works at Mecklenburg is that uh, in between when it's ready and when it launches is like one to 12 months of navel gazing. So this isn't in production for us yet, but I'm hoping to get it out there as soon as we can. Uh, other neat thing is, is this replaces the separate embed print project and the uh, uh, report project, because it's all built into here now. The embed is built into here and the uh, report is all built in. So it replaces those other projects. And because I'm arguably smarter, uh, arguably, the old projects to do what this does, even though this does a whole lot more, was about 7,000 lines of code in everything. Uh, that's for the dashboard project and the embed project and the report project. Uh, and this is, when I say lines of code, this is lines of code in the project itself, not the, not the dependencies for the project. We've gone from 890 lines of separate CSS to 79. And a, a large part of that is I'm using Vuetify for everything, which has its, its own CSS. Went from almost 2,000 lines of separate dedicated JavaScript to 500. Went from 3,500 lines in Vue to 2,800 and 600 some lines of HTML to about 113 lines. So we, I've, I've literally cut the code base for the project in half while doing all of this extra stuff, which uh, as someone has, has to maintain this, I'm super happy about. Code is out there, enjoy, please, please let me know if you spot bugs or, or unclear documentation or anything like that, just put an issue on GitHub and uh, uh, people people feel weird or bad about doing that. You're doing me a favor when you report issues. And sometimes as a developer, you look at people reporting, hey, it's not working, hey, it's not working. And it, 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 it irritates you. Um, but you have to remind yourself, these people are doing you a favor even if they're reporting something that isn't really a problem, what that's telling you is there's something about your interface or your documentation that wasn't clear enough for them to not understand it wasn't a problem. So they're doing you a favor. I always remind myself of that. So if you spot anything, let me know. 
that's all I've got for you at this point. I'll probably be uh, posting little patches and tweaks as I run into them uh, here and there, but it's feature complete. And I didn't poke every single thing on every single browser, but everything seems to be working pretty good. I will catch you later. Bye-bye.